Hi, this is Heather Garon from the sonatasandpartitas.com and this video is a part three video about the very well-known, much loved G minor fugue, BWV 1001. Now, part one discussed only the exposition of the fugue, um, how Bach introduces it for voices, but I also took the opportunity to discuss that in terms of the rule of the octave. So it's a very short passage of music that shows kind of note by note Basically, you could say how the rule of the octave works in the wild. Um, part two video discusses the rest of the section of how Bach establishes his key of G minor. Now, this part three video, I'm going to discuss what happens after we're firmly established in G minor. Now, what I would like to start by just pointing out a little bit. When you have these great big long pieces, I think one of the challenges of playing them and of listening to them is to feel like you're not just kind of like floating from your favorite part to your other favorite part to your other favorite part and it's just gets this kind of meandery type feel especially with Bach because Bach is so directional and um, I was a, heard a master class of Julian Bream once and a student was playing this fugue and the first thing Julian Bream said was how do we play this so that it can hold together? Um, the important thing is, as a musician, particularly in a work of this nature, is to give the feeling that when you sort of heard the first note, you've almost heard the last note. You've got to give a wonderful overall sweep. And if you go on mind. YouTube and watch some Julian Bream master classes, you'll see the first thing he talks about, and he talks about it often, is the long range. And it must be meticulously played. Also, um, the feeling of shape is very important in these very big, large and expansive melodies. This question, when Frank Coots and I were working on the Sonatas and Partitas, really took up a lot of my interest of like, how does Bach manage to write pieces that just sound so cohesive? And what I saw in every single one of the pieces in the Sonatas and Partitas is that this is what Bach does. He establishes a key, he goes somewhere, he lands there very um, um, palpably, and then often he stays there. Like sometimes the music will literally stop, like you'll have the longest note in the piece aside from the last note. This is the Alamon from the second partita, and a perfect authentic cadence ending on the longest note in the piece. Or he'll, a place where the harmony's kind of been changing once or twice per bar, the harmony will suddenly stay the same for one or two bars. That's what happens in the fugue here. It also happens in the presto in the sonata with a brand new motive. That's a lot of people's favorite part. And then after that, there's often a, um, like what I call a turning around motive. Like sometimes it just is like little filigree of um, uh, a little ornament or something. And it really feels like there's somebody like grabbing the steering wheel and saying, okay, now we're gonna go this way. This is John Williams playing the lure of the third partita. Now he's arrived, and there's that turnaround motive. And from that moment on, we're heading home, and then we get home. And you could say that everything that happens, like in this fugue, everything that happens from that moment that that key of G minor is firmly established, up until we get to, in this fugue, it's that B flat, to take us there. And everything that happens after happens to take us home. And so that is what I want to look at in this fugue. So let's get started. So for myself, when I'm learning something by Bach, especially one of his big monumental pieces, one of the first things I do is I ask myself the question, where does this turn around? And if I can't find it, I'll use the golden ratio. Now the golden ratio was first mentioned by Euclid about 300 BC and then with the revival of the ancient Greek philosophies in the Renaissance, the golden ratio once again came to the fore and it was used pretty much in all their art forms, although I'm not sure about music, but definitely in their paintings and their architecture. And now Bach inherited this and it does show up in his music. Now to find the exact golden ratio, 
We can use a Fibonacci series where you start with zero and one, and then you add those two numbers and you get one. And then you add the last two numbers in your series. So one plus one is two. And then again, add the last two numbers is three. And then two plus three is five. Five plus three is eight, 13, 21, and so on. So if you're looking at a piece of music with 34 measures, it's probably gonna turn around and start heading back home at measure 21. And to approximate it, you just multiply by two and divide by three. So now for this fugue, there are 94 measures. So multiply by two, you get 188. Divide by three, you get 62. And add a little bit on at measure 64, we have what a lot of students tell me is their favorite part. <laughs> I'm glad that's your favorite part because that is the whole reason in a sense you could say for the fugue's existence. It's like if you're going skiing, well hopefully the skiing is your favorite part, but you know, on the way you might stop at a cafe and you might take some pretty pictures, but you're going skiing. And here, we're going here. From the time that Bach finishes establishing G minor until he gets there and then we just kind of like sit on this B flat chord. And then really, there are two more lines of music and then we're at a dominant of G minor. And that dominant of G minor, I mean, if you think of what's a tonic and what's a dominant, like the tonic's the home key, but you know, like if I just play, that's just a sound. But if I go, well, when I play this G, that's telling me that makes this feel like home. And so the dominant is really what defines the key, not the tonic. And so here, basically we've taken 62 measures to get to B flat. And then within only four measures, we get that dominant pedal. And so I normally think of these big pieces of music where you're going somewhere great and you take the scenic route there and then you take the shortcut home. And that's definitely what happens in this fugue. So let's look a little bit closer now. How do we get to B flat? Well, the quick answer to that question is that first Bach makes his way to D, the dominant, and then he goes down a step to C minor and down a step to B flat. So down a step and down a step. And it's interesting to look at that kind of in the light of the exposition where Bach gave us the answer, not in the dominant above, but in the dominant below, which is the subdominant. And really this fugue has a lot of sort of a downward movement, which gives it um, some of its dark uh, quality, I find. So here we're starting. So we could mistakenly say that Bach is just gonna repeat the exposition up an octave. That would be called redundant entries. But no, that's not what Bach does. He goes on D, then on G, and he's going to continue on with a circle of fifths. And now on F. So a descending circle of fifths, again, moving down by fifths, not up. And now B flat. Now it's truncated. And on E flat, and then back up to B flat. And then here. So what do we have here? We have E7, and that's the dominant of A. And now we're going to get the subject again in the bass. Now, whenever we hear the subject in the bass, Bach is actually telling an educated listener that we are nearing an important cadence. This, the subject in the bass is always the last time you hear it in that sort of like grouping of subjects. So now... So we know we're heading to D. There is tension resolve, tension resolve, tension, cadence. And there we are on D with it in the bass and the soprano. And then now we're going to get the subject in the three voices. Here, 
It's good to follow the articulation in the violin slurring. Bach always has like the first one is tense and then it resolves. Guitarists often tend to articulate this grouping the repeated melody notes together. But if you um, articulate it by the violin slurs, you get much more flow like that. So here is that. When we hear this, we're expecting this. But what Bach gives us instead is this. And when we hear this, what we want to hear next is we want to resolve like that and then like that. So twice Bach has kind of like deceived us on top of a deception. And now we're so used to hearing this fugue that we hear kind of as if it's a sort of a non-event. So it's important to realize that this is somewhat of a shock. And here, and now he's going to repeat it. Will he give it to us this time? That's That would be giving it to us. But no, he doesn't. He does that. So now he's really making us want that D minor chord. wait for something and wait and wait and wait we finally get it first thing he does is he leaves and he leaves by a circle of fifths so here again it's going to be a descending circle of fifths D to G to C and now to F the circle of fifths is going to speed up B flat E flat A and now speed up some more D Again, like I explained earlier on, the dominant defines the key, not the tonic. So now that we're here on the dominant, Bach is going to make us wait, but now we know we're waiting for that C minor. So we've got a dominant pedal, flat six. starting on A telling us that we're heading to D in the bass. Now we've got the subject on G in the bass. So we know we're just about there at C. We're not only going to get the subject, we're getting subject and an answer and another answer up the octave, just like in the exposition at the beginning. And now what we're going to keep going to B flat, big B flat. Ascending circle of fifths. C, F, B, E, A, D, G, C, F, B flat. And now we're landed on B flat, but not quite because we don't have it in the top yet. But we know that we're in the B flat home territory, and suddenly the fugue feels very different. Like it's much more calm. Like 
you're not really sure where you're going or how you're getting there. But now you're starting to feel. Ah, now when we hear that, we know we're on a dominant. We're on the dominant of G minor. And there's the dominant pedal that I was mentioning earlier. And so, um, my suggestion to you is to go from this dominant pedal and follow it through to the resolution of G minor. See if you can see it in this regard where Bach is almost handing you G minor, he takes it away. He hands it, he takes it away. And the more he hands it and takes it away, the more the tension mounts. And the more the tension mounts, the more it can relax when you finally get that G minor. Now here we're gonna get it slightly before the end of the piece and there's gonna be a coda which is always what happens in these pieces of monumental proportions because you can't just have this great big thing and then boom, finish, we're done. Like there's always has to be a kind of a winding down. So again, play it and really feel the difference between when we're winding down and when we're doing this, hand it, take it away, hand it, take it away. Now, the other thing I just want to address um, about this video, now, when I was in music school, we did a whole term on fugal writing. And what we did was we analyzed a lot of fugues and what we had to do was underline the subject, underline the counter subject, underline the answer, mark out all the perfect authentic cadences and label the keys. And we had to memorize 28 terms. And I was actually really good at it. Like my fugal analysis pages were black with underlines and keys and I got everything labeled. I never missed a thing. But the thing is, it did get kind of boring after a while. And the way I look at that now, it's a little bit like the game of Find Waldo. Like, you, it's really hard to find him, but finally you find him and you circle him and you go to the next page and you find him and you circle him. But none of the pages are really related to each other. And even within the page, like, okay, Waldo's at the fair, but you never ask yourself, why is Waldo at the fair and why is he at the stall with the rubber duckies? It, the same thing with the fugue. It's like, why is he going to D? Why is he going to G? What's the purpose of this thing on C? But the fact is, we have entries on, on D and then we have entries on C. And then we get to B flat. Well, after we get to B flat, there are no more entries because we don't need them anymore. And the other thing you could look at is, well, why D, why C? But what happens is when we get to C, well, first of all, we get the entries the same way as the exposition. We get subject, answer, answer up the octave. But what also happens in this section on C is that we're, we're kind of over the long term, we're going two to five to one in B flat. We're going C to F to B flat. And what happens is we're getting the entries and then we get circles of fifths until we get to the F and the B flat. And also when we're going from D to C, well, we're going D to the, to, we land on that G7 to C. So we're going D, circle of fifths till we land on five, seven to one. So we have two to five, seven to one in C. And then we have two to five, seven to one in B flat. And essentially you could say that a summary of the fugue is there's the exposition that tells us where the subject is and then he finishes establishing his key. And then, well, you could summarize all of Bach by saying he's either going somewhere or he's landed. And just before he lands, he teases us. He hands it, takes it away, hands it, takes it away. And then just after he lands, the first thing he does is he leaves. And he leaves via a circle of fifths. So here we've established the key and we make our way to D. And we have two, five, one, going to C, two, five, one, going to B flat. We arrive at B flat, we have this beautiful motive. Right away there's a dominant pedal. It takes us back to the home key. And then there's a coda. That's kind of the pillars and posts of this fugue. So I hope you found this helpful. As always, please let us know what you think by commenting below. If you'd like to get copies of the score, they're available at our website. They're available either as a single volume of all the sonatas and partitas our individual volumes from the separate works, and that is available at our website, sonatasandpartitas.com.